we pray that we would hear your voice, Lord, as we gather together around your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the last in our series on 1 Peter, which began on the 15th of February, or possibly in AD 33. Uh, with this, it, Peter begins uh, with this greeting to Christians dispersed around the Roman Empire. To God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. We remember back to last week, to Jesus' new and radical for the time, inclusion of women with men together as the co-heirs of Christ. And Peter's focus is consistently corporate with the ecclesia gathered together. In the Times magazine, Caitlin Moran was recently remembering the Olympics opening ceremony and that corporate communal feeling where we all gathered together. Not one gender, not one ethnicity or age group or type. And the feeling we had when, as she put it, we fell in love with ourselves, feeling for months of afterglow, special and astonishing, because we'd all in our differences gathered in. And so we see ourselves this morning in all our differences, gathering in as the church, Gather in, says Peter, to those exiled and vulnerable. Gather into this new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. And so we've been gathering each week around this cruciform pattern, Jesus' life offered up his crucifixion, his resurrection. And so shall we read together the, the last section uh, that we'll be doing in this series. It's 1 Peter 3, verses 8 to 22. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever among you would love life and see good days must keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what's right, you are blessed. Don't fear what they fear. Don't be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So, shall we start with the slightly mystifying uh, stuff at the end? Uh, Noah's Ark, in it only a few people, eight in all, 
were saved through water. And that tiny remnant became us, who in chapter 2, Peter calls a people belonging to God. Those eight were, it says, saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism. Baptism, when we take a stand and renounce evil, just like Noah did, where we declare our allegiance, trust, and love for God, like Noah did. And then the eight on the ark became us. And then did you notice as well in that end section, it says, verse 19, Christ went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. Now, I have read many, many interpretations uh, of this in the last fortnight, and even the cleverest minds can't seem to quite agree. They can't even give me a definitive answer down at St. Melitus. It could be that Jesus is reaching down into the deadest places, as we know he does, with his livingness. Or it could be a reference to a tradition by which in the days of Noah, fallen angels were believed to have had bodily relations with earthly women whose offspring were evil spirits. And does this then remind us that Christ has authority over even these evil spirits as he has authority over all powers that might oppress us? So that's a little end bit. Back now to the beginning of the passage. There are five Greek words. First, live in harmony with one another. Homophrenes, the Greek word. Be like-minded. Second, be sympathetic. Sympathes, the Greek word. Third, love one another. Philadelphoi, brotherly, sisterly love. Fourth, be compassionate or tender-hearted, you splanknoi is the Greek word. And fifth, be humble, tapenophrones, five Greek words. And one is tempted to uh, think that Peter is simply telling us how to behave. But if we disconnect this passage from all that's gone before us in the series we've been doing, we just kind of end up with a self-help manual. No, these things grow out of the fact that we are gathering this morning around the Trinity God. Be like-minded, homophrenes. This isn't about behavior so much. It's not about us acting in certain ways, not even about loving people. This is a statement about who we worship, who the whole thing is about, why we're even here this morning. Our like-mindedness doesn't first come from loving each other, but by loving this God, this particular God, who called the whole thing into being by his word and filled it with his spirit. This is the God whose story must be told, whose pattern seen in Jesus' self-offering and crucifixion and resurrection we are invited to live. We are this morning like-minded homophrenes because we agree on this. This is the pattern into which we place our lives together in a like-minded way. It's not something we constitute in little church committees. This is something constituted from beyond ourselves. This is our the Trinity God, creator, Father, Holy Spirit, crucified, risen Messiah. And so this is our schema, our shared pattern, and we'll enact the pattern as we come together with others around the world in our diversity and in our imperfection to take communion today. So that's Homophrodes. And now, Stimpathes, our common love is the shared passion we feel for this Trinity God, we love the one who first loved us. So there are our first two words, a small bit of Greek to wake us up, and they relate to God, homophrenes and sympathes, and we gather around them and say together, this is our God, our shared pattern and our shared passion.
So the next three words are more horizontal. They're, they're how we are with each other. Philadelphia, brotherly, sisterly love. Because this is our God, because this is our God, this is how we act. Love one another. This transcends feelings of mutual affection, which hopefully we at times feel for each other, but realistically may not always. It goes beyond that. I remember uh, sitting outside our chalets uh, late at night, one focus, uh, if you're new to this church, focus is the holiday we go on, us and, and uh, lots of other churches. And we were wrapped up in rugs on a balmy uh, July in England, and a friend turned to me and said, these are my people. These are my people. And I felt strangely touched by that. These are the people we uphold, the people we serve, we look out for, we belong to, we stand in openness towards, which can be quite hard, can't it? Because we're all a little bit annoying sometimes. But the point is, we are us. The fourth word, compassion. B says, be compassionate. You splank not. I remember years ago, Nikki telling us that the Greeks perceived emotion to be felt in their splank in their in their gut. And we allow our guts to be affected by the lives of others. If they're sad, we're literally gutted. We join in each other's joys, sorrows, needs, because our lives are bound together. I was reminded of this when many of us came together at Keith Savile's memorial service, and I've asked uh, the family's permission to mention this this morning. If you didn't know Keith, he was such a man of God, and he enfleshed these five words so powerfully that we were gutted by his early death because our lives are bound together. And he wasn't just him, though he was utterly him, he was also us. Be humble, the fifth word, tapenophronis. And Keith inhabited this word so fully and so authentically, like Jesus who washed his disciples' feet. This, we would all agree, was neither a squeamish nor a self-centered approach to friendship. And there's such a danger, isn't there, that we can have this shallow, utilitarian approach to people. What can you give me? Where can you get me? That's why I always feel a bit funny about that networking word, which says, what can I get out of you? Eyes roaming the room for a little bit of gold dust. But maybe, wouldn't Jesus say, the gold is somewhere else? Maybe we could do some reverse networking look for someone who needs some of our help. Show me someone in the room who needs a boost, who's feeling marginalized, who's feeling a bit not gold, a bit not even bronze. Because of course everyone is gold because we're made in the image of God and we're called to be a radical community. That's the title of the series. And then we could do some reverse slander, because slander's out, chapter 2, verse 1, and here, chapter 3, verse 10. When someone's name comes up, we could try thinking about something that perhaps others haven't noticed about that person, which would change people's view of them for the better, because we're called to be a radical community. And so by these two Greek words, the homophrones and sympathes, our like-mindedness, our common love, we say this is our God, our shared pattern. And we love this God. He's our shared passion. And by these three words, Philadelphia, brotherly, sisterly love, by the tender-heartedness that we feel in our guts for each other, and by humility, a desire to lift Others are, not ourselves. Tapenophrones, we can be recognized. So first, this is our God, and second, this is us. So we feel great. Well, that's that sorted. Except, Peter says, it's not quite. There's still evil about in the church. I mean, even on the ark, there were only eight people. But don't you bet that they argued about something? They're bound to vote about something, probably who would clear out the guinea pig, I would think. Something 
because we're human. And then out of that eight, we turned into this big Olympic, Paralympic kind of crowd, waving and dancing and celebrating like you might see in the photos in a focus brochure. Look at us, so happy, so redeemed. But in the crowds, unseen to the camera, there's no doubt someone saying, I can't see a thing. If only that woman would take her hat off. At the theatre the other night, we were high up in the upper circle. And an elderly man with a really, really bad back needed an end row seat. And in the interval, one was found. There'd been one empty through the, the first half. But a middle-aged woman with no apparent bad back had had her eye on this empty seat through the first half. The steward was keen to move the elderly man with the bad back into the empty seat. And this woman went into a sort of crazed rage, which involved her talking loudly about my seat, which wasn't remotely her seat, throughout the second half. And then at the key moment of pathos and tension, five minutes from the end of the play, into the pin drop silence of the theatre, she said loudly to her friend, Pauline, I've had enough of this, let's go. And she and Pauline crashed along the road, glaring at the elderly man with the bad back, smashing their handbags against our knees and treading on people's feet. And the thing is that even the church is made up of normal human beings, like me, for example, with Pauline tendencies. Am I immune from wanting the best for myself? Am I immune from treading on others' feelings? Am I immune from throwing up my own hands in exasperation with others? And maybe she felt really bad about it in the morning. And just because we get one thing very wrong, it doesn't mean we can't get other things very right. But in my own imperfections, certainly on the night and even the next morning, and even a little bit now, I only half want to forgive Pauline and her friend for being mean to the old man and of course, annoying me. <laughs> but communion is coming, and in our imperfections, we gather in. We look at Jesus. He was sent to show us the pattern, like the adult bird shows its young how to fly by flying first. And so we watch him. But despite his example, despite the creative love of the Father, despite the empowering Holy Spirit, upon whose currents we're encouraged to take a risk and fly, we can still feel, verse 9, this powerful inclination to be cross and to retaliate and to not forgive. And retaliation, we know, just creates a chain as our horribleness just spreads from loop to loop. And so, this morning, we're called to break the chain like Jesus supremely did. On Monday morning, October the 2nd, 2006, a gunman entered a one-room Amish school in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. In front of 25 pupils, 32-year-old Charles Roberts ordered the boys and the teacher to leave. After tying the legs of the 10 remaining girls, Roberts prepared to shoot them. The oldest hostage, a 13-year-old, begged Roberts, shoot me first and let the little ones go. She was a 13-year-old girl who knew the pattern, who shared the passion. Refusing her offer, he opened fire on all of them, killing five and leaving the others critically wounded. He then shot himself as police stormed the building. The blood was barely dry on the schoolhouse floor when Amish parents brought words of forgiveness to the family of the killer, Charles Roberts the man who'd killed their daughters. 
fresh from the funerals where they buried their own children, grieving Amish families, accounted for half of the 75 people who attended the killer's burial. They went to comfort the mother and the widow of the man who'd killed their daughters, and they supported a fund for his family. Javier Espinosa, the Spanish journalist who's just been released by ISIS, recalls that James Foley made a plan to escape with another hostage, John Cantley. Foley got away, but Cantley was stopped. James Foley gave himself up. He said, I couldn't leave John on his own. James Foley was beheaded, as you know, in August 2014. I suppose you could say that he'd given his life for Cantley. Whether he knew this or not, he looked at the horror of his circumstances from inside Jesus' cruciform pattern of self-offering. James Foley, like Jesus, could have freed himself, but he didn't. Jesus looked out from the cross. They were killing him at the same moment as he was forgiving them. And this pattern of crucifixion and resurrection, this is what we're called to. Firstly, this is our God, our shared pattern, our shared passion. Secondly, this is us who unite around this God. And thirdly, this is our way because it's God's way. The way is in our lips, Peter says. So often scripture reminds us. Verse 15, we give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And that makes sense, doesn't it? We ask for God's help to be people of those five Greek words, like-mindedness, sympathy, love, compassion, humility, so that we don't bring God into disrepute. Actually, says Peter, it starts further down than your lips. It's deeper in your hearts. Don't fear what others fear, verse 14. Set apart Christ as Lord, verse 15. Set him apart. Look at him. Look at him. Learn from him. Be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Peter says, come on, let's go deeper. It's all very well saying, this is our God, this is us, this is our way. It's just words and, and songs. But what stops us living the words and living the songs, I don't know, perhaps it is, as verse 13 suggests, are we a bit scared others might harm us? Verse 17, we might have to suffer. Those are real fears. For me, I'm sure for you too. And yet that last verse 22 says, we have nothing to fear. Jesus Christ has gone into heaven. He's at God's right hand. Angels, authorities, powers in submission to him. And we need somehow through God's help, through God's example, inspired by the 13-year-old girl in the schoolroom, by James Foley who turned back for his friend to let go of our fears, which is really hard. But we didn't gather in around a fear of death this morning but around a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And so Peter says, don't fear what others fear. We so easily fear death. And actually, don't we a bit fear each other? And we fear losing things that matter to us, our, our, our reputation, control, money, whatever they are for you, for me. I read a great commentary, Douglas Harrink on 1 Peter, and he says about these lordless powers, these beliefs we hold deep down in things like democracy or the global economy. Or for me, I've got this powerful belief in equality, which can make me feel quite violent. But we have a pattern and it's non-violent. It's a non-violent response of Jesus who emptied himself. And so I've got to give him my passion for equality. And he gives it back to me 
emptied of my ego. I, for one, would never have been drawn by any other sort of God than the Trinity God. I was doing Alpha, as Nikki said, in 1991. And my friend and I were sitting under the apple tree in my parents' back garden. She said to me, Jo, please don't become a Christian. I hate Christians. And I thought of the Trinity God, and I thought, there's no nastiness or pettiness in this God. And I said, but this God is love. So if I take this step, our friendship can only get even better. I said, I'd go so far to say that if this God isn't real, and admittedly, I have only just noticed him myself, we human beings might not have any capacity for love or friendship at all, because it's out of his love that we love. And in the last 24 years, in my times of greatest pain, the love of the Trinity was the answer, the comfort of the wounded God who could join me in the depths, bring his livingness to the valleys of the shadow of death where I've had to go, and who embraces those at the edges with particular intent and love. So I don't know if today feels hard or easy for you, whether you feel at the edges or in the valued mainstream, whether you feel bronze or gold or neither. I don't know whether the sun is shining or whether it's grey. I don't know if you feel the love of God today. Written on the wall of Auschwitz, an anonymous poem. I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even though I don't feel it. I believe in God, even when he's silent. As a sheep before her shearers is silent, Isaiah 53. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, though he'd done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. My righteous servant will justify many, many, many. And here's the place we can look beyond ourselves with great love to everyone else, not just to our people, on whom we practice those five words, like-mindedness, sympathy, love, compassion, humility. We go a bit wrong and we forgive each other because it's like a trial run on ourselves. But we look beyond to those who are stumbling on the capstone of chapter two, for those who are sitting under other apple trees saying, I hate Christians, perhaps because partly we didn't get it quite right. And none of us gets it quite right. We see each other's blind spots, but it's harder to see our own. We bash others with our handbags and tread on each other's feet and don't get the pattern. And so they don't like God. But the media story about the killer Charles Roberts changed. Forgiveness eclipsed the tragic story, trumping the violence and arresting the world's attention in an echo of Jesus' life, in the seemingly impossible love of that Amish community, in their tender-heartedness, in their humility. This is our God, our shared pattern, our shared passion. And because of this God, this is us, united around those five words of radical living. And this is our way, thirdly, to go against the grain, like the one who said, I am the way, and provoked huge questions with his life and with his death, and whose resurrection appearance was like lightning, transforming our understanding of our own future beyond death. We're all like grass, it says in chapter one. We wither and fall. Do our lives and deaths provoke questions? Gather in, says Peter, gather in. 
cancel all normal expectations and gather around this pattern of love and grace and bring whoever wants to come. Even bring Pauline and her friend from the upper circle of the theater. Certainly bring the mother of Charles Roberts, who following her own son's terrible crime and suicide, went every Thursday to care for one of the girls who'd been very severely disabled by her son's bullet. Bring the family who welcomed her every Thursday. Because love is useless if it remains a feeling in our hearts. It's what our love prompts us to do. That's the key thing. What does the love of God and our love for God prompt us to do? That's the key thing if we're to be a radical community. And so in ending, Peter says, stand fast, stand fast. And peace to all of you who are in Christ. And so this morning, to all of you, every single one of you who've gathered in, may you know his peace, which passes all understanding.